Greetings and welcome to Learn iPhone Camera, a video tutorial from the MacU.com. Through these lessons, we'll be looking at how to use all the various modes, tools, and features available in the built-in iPhone camera app. I'm going to be using two iPhones, an iPhone X here on the left and an iPhone 6S here on the right. The major difference between the cameras on these two phones is that the iPhone X has a dual camera setup. This enables it to have a 2x optical zoom and utilize portrait mode. Both of these are 12 megapixel cameras. The single camera on the iPhone 6s is also 12 megapixels. Notice that portrait mode isn't available here on the iPhone 6s because it only has a single camera, which can't pull off the portrait mode shots. So far, the only iPhones with dual lenses are the iPhone 7 and 8 Plus and the iPhone 10. Before we get into the camera app, let's first see the different ways that we can launch it. Number one, of course, is to tap on the camera app icon. But the camera can also be accessed from the lock screen of the iPhone. Here on the iPhone X, use 3D Touch to press on the camera icon to jump into it. On any iPhone with a home button, swipe left to quickly access the camera from the lock screen. From any app or home screen, the camera can be accessed from Control Center. On the iPhone X, swipe down from the upper right corner. On iPhones with a home button, swipe up from the bottom. Then tap the camera icon. While in the camera app, I'll have the two iPhones set up as they are now much of the time. Our model for many lessons will be the trusty Dwight bobblehead, which you may have seen in other tutorials. I'll also be recording the screen of the iPhone as shots are taken outdoors in some lessons. With that, let's get started with a look at the general interface of the camera app. In this lesson, we're going to go over the general interface that we see here in the camera app. Across the top of the display, we have buttons for the flash, live photos, the self-timer, and filters. On the iPhone 6s, we also have HDR controls. We'll go over each of these in their own lessons. In the center of the display is essentially the viewfinder, or what the camera lens is seeing. We can interact with this area to set a focus point, adjust exposure, and zoom. Below that we have the camera modes displayed. We can switch camera modes by swiping left or right anywhere on the viewfinder or over the mode names themselves. You can also tap a mode name to jump to it. On the bottom left is the button to let us review photos recently taken or added to the photos library. In the center here we have the shutter button. This will turn red when we move to one of the video modes. Along with the shutter button here on the display, either volume button on the side of the iPhone will also work as a shutter. In the lower right, tap to flip around to the front or selfie camera. Of course, we can also operate the camera in landscape orientation. In fact, you might take pictures, and especially video, more often in landscape than in portrait orientation. The interface remains almost exactly the same here, with the controls across the top and bottom moving to the sides and the icons rotating to display in the correct direction. The only items that don't really change are the photo mode names. We now need to swipe up and down to go from mode to mode. Next up, we'll look at setting focus and exposure while taking a picture or video.
Any iPhone camera is going to default to autofocus, which will try to find the subject of the photo and focus on that subject. So as the Dwight bobblehead comes into frame here, each iPhone will adjust its focus from the desk and background to the Dwight bobblehead. If I still want to focus on the wall behind Dwight, I can tap on that area and the iPhone will focus there. Notice that Dwight's face is now a little blurry. Tap on his face and the camera refocuses there. So this can be really helpful if you might not want to focus on the most obvious object in the frame. Or if you're shooting a busy scene, like the flowers on this tree. Here I can tap to quickly focus on the flowers near me, or those further away. We can quickly adjust the exposure of an image by tapping to establish the focus point and then dragging either up or down to adjust the exposure of the shot. Drag up to increase exposure, making the image brighter, or drag down to decrease, making the image darker. To reset this, just tap again to choose a different focus point. I'm going to move Dwight back a bit now and set the focus on him. If I then move another object in, like this baseball, eventually the focus will reset automatically onto that ball. If I do that again, but this time tap and hold for a couple seconds on Dwight's head, auto exposure and focus lock is enabled. Now no matter where the ball goes in the image, the focus isn't going to change. To turn off the exposure and focus lock, just tap elsewhere to reset. So when it comes to focus and exposure, remember to single tap to set a focus point. Tap to set the focus point and then drag up and down to adjust exposure. And to lock in your focus and exposure, tap and hold on the desired focus point for a couple seconds. Any iPhone can zoom in on a subject, but only iPhones with multiple cameras have an optical zoom. The zoom function on the iPhone 6s here, and any other iPhone with a single camera, is a digital zoom, which is the same thing as cropping a photo in an editing app. Digital zoom just makes the displayed area of the image larger, which will decrease resolution and quality. Basically, the more you zoom in, the fewer megapixels you're going to be using for the image. The only way to zoom on the iPhone 6s here is to use the common iOS multi-touch gesture called pinch to zoom. Even though you actually spread two fingers to zoom in and pinch to zoom out. After I do that, we do get a slider here to make more subtle adjustments if needed. We can zoom up to five times here using the digital zoom. On an iPhone with dual cameras, like the iPhone X, we do have an optical zoom because one camera is two times the focal length of the other. So here I can tap the 1x button for an instant zoom to 2x, switching from one camera to the other. Tap again to zoom back out. Since this is an optical zoom, we're not losing any resolution. We get the same 12 megapixel image resolution shooting at 2x as we do at 1. We can also use the pinch to zoom gesture here. Or tap and drag on the 1x button for a zoom slider. Notice that we can zoom by tenths. This is going to be a digital zoom until we hit 2x, and it'll switch to the second camera. So you're actually losing resolution when this is anywhere between 1.1 and 1.9x. At 2x, we're back to the full 12 megapixels of the second camera. 
Anything beyond that is again a digital zoom and reducing resolution. We can get up to a 10 times digital zoom here, which is equal to 5 times from the second camera. So when I shoot with an iPhone, I tend to avoid zooming unless I have that second camera. And in that case, I'll usually just use the 2x zoom, since it will have the same 12 megapixel image as 1x. If I do want to crop an image, I can do that after shooting it in the Photos app. Like with Exposure and Focus, by default, the flash on the iPhone will only activate automatically. If the camera feels there's not enough light in a scene, then the flash symbol will appear here at the top of the display, letting us know that it's going to be used. If I turn the lights in this room back on, the camera is going to reassess and realize there's no longer a need for the flash. Turn the lights back off and the flash symbol returns. But if you take a photo with the flash on and it doesn't turn out well, like this one, we can deactivate the flash by tapping here in the upper left and turning it off. Now when I take that photo, the flash doesn't go off. The iPhone just does its best with the currently available lighting. In dark scenes like this, a still subject can turn out really well. But if something is moving, like the bobbling head here, it can turn out blurry. Using a flash is going to freeze the action better. Switch the flash to on now, and it's going to fire every time I take a photo, no matter what the lighting conditions. The flash on an iPhone camera can be a great tool. I usually keep the iPhone flash on automatic, and when it needs to be used, take one photo of the subject with the flash on, and one with it turned off, and then see which image I prefer. Using the burst feature on the iPhone camera will take several photos in just a few seconds. This can be a great option when trying to capture an action shot, or just to get that elusive moment when everyone's smiling with their eyes open in a group photo. To shoot a burst, just tap and hold on the shutter. As I hold, the number of shots being taken will appear on the lower part of the display. It just takes a couple seconds to get up over 20 or 30 shots. When reviewing these, they're not stored as 20 to 30 separate images. We have a single burst here, and the amount of photos included within it is displayed. Tap the Select button here, and we can review all the images taken in the burst. There may only be one or two images in a burst that you end up wanting to keep. Just tap to add a check mark to those, and then we can tap Done. Now I can choose to still keep all the burst images, or only the two that I selected. I'm going to only keep these two. Now let's do an action shot on the iPhone X. As the dog comes running towards the camera, I'll hold down the shutter to begin the burst. Let's replay that a little slower. So I ended up getting six shots in that burst. As I review them, I'm just going to keep the one shot that I really like. So the burst feature is super simple to use, and it can really help out when you're trying to capture that one second where everything is right in a photo. The self-timer on the iPhone camera can allow the photographer to be included in the photo. 
Or it can be a good way to prevent blurry images due to handheld shaking or even tapping the shutter when shooting a dark scene. The self-timer options can be accessed here. We can choose a 3 or 10 second delay. 10 seconds is probably going to be the best option for the photographer to move from behind the camera into the shot comfortably. With the 10 second self timer selected, when I tap the shutter, a countdown begins. During the countdown, the flash will light up each second, letting those in the shot know when the photo is going to be taken. This won't affect whether or not the flash will fire during the shot. At the end of that countdown, a 10 image burst is shot, which can then be reviewed. If you're shooting a dark scene and you don't want to use the flash, utilizing the self timer and a tripod can help with getting a crisp image. When you tap the shutter button on the display, or the volume button to trigger the shutter, the iPhone could potentially shake a bit. But with the self timer set to 3 seconds, that shake or vibration won't affect the shot and you're going to have your best chance at a dark scene that doesn't end up blurry. The 3 second self timer will also shoot a 10 image burst. This button will bring us into the filters menu. Filters are color adjustments that can be applied in the camera before the photo is taken. They can also be applied, changed, or removed after the photo has been taken. When I tap the filters button, the viewfinder moves up to make room for the filters slider below. Swipe through here to preview the various filters, which all have names. Notice that when we have a filter applied, the filters button is colored. Take a photo and the filter is applied to that photo. But it also remains applied to the next photo unless I change to a different filter or swipe back to the original setting. With this selected, tap the filters button again to close the filter slider. Only when the filters button is gray like this are we seeing the unfiltered image. So it can actually be pretty easy to take multiple shots with a filter applied without really wanting the filter. But if I go to review my photos, and then tap edit, notice that we also have a filters button here. Tap and I can see what filter is applied. Swipe to switch filters, or choose original to remove all the filters. Remember to tap done here to save. HDR, which stands for High Dynamic Range, can greatly improve photos that contain a high contrast between the brightest and darkest areas of the photo. Most often, this will happen when shooting with the sun or primary light source behind the subject. Notice here on the iPhone 6S, we have an HDR button where we can choose HDR to activate automatically, have it on all the time, or leave it off completely. Currently on the iPhone 10, we don't have an HDR button. This is because HDR in the iPhone 10 can be set to automatic in the camera settings. So here in the settings app and camera, we have an HDR section where we can activate auto HDR. In the iPhone 6S camera settings, we just have the Keep Normal Photo setting on. Auto HDR being available here on the iPhone 10 is due to the quality and performance ability of the camera sensor. I've left Auto HDR on here since I've owned the iPhone 10. With the Keep Normal Photo option on, when an HDR image is taken, you end up with two images, the HDR shot and the standard non-HDR shot. So here on the iPhone 10, we have a scene with the bright sun and sky behind this lilac bush and house. As I adjust the scene, notice the HDR indicator turns on and off.
If it's on here, an HDR shot will be taken when the shutter is pressed. Notice that the sky is getting completely blown out to white here in the viewfinder. This is why HDR is needed in this shot. So I'll take the photo. And now when reviewing it, notice that the sky isn't blown out. Swipe back and we get the standard shot, which has a large blown out area that's all white. So HDR really improved the look of this shot. Usually I choose to leave the Keep Normal Photo option off to save disk space. The HDR version of a shot is almost always better or equal to the standard shot anyway. The main reason to leave this on is to have a comparison to the HDR shot, like we did in this example. The Live Photo option was introduced a few years ago with the iPhone 6S. Here in the camera app, I have Live Photo turned off on both phones. Activate Tap the Live Photo button. When this is yellow, a live photo will be taken each time the shutter is pressed. So what exactly is a live photo? When the shutter is tapped, while live photo mode is turned on, the iPhone is actually going to record video and audio one and a half seconds prior to and after the shutter being pressed, resulting in a three second live photo. So this means when the camera app is open and live photo is active, the iPhone is always recording the last one and a half seconds of video, but it's automatically discarded unless the shutter is pressed. So when you're shooting a live photo, it's a good idea to hold still for a few seconds while taking the shot, or you can end up with a blurry recording of the iPhone being lifted up to your eyes or put down after taking the shot. When reviewing a live photo, notice that there will be a live photo icon in the upper left, letting us know that it's live. To view it, tap and hold and the video will play. Tap edit and we can set a key photo. This will be the frame of the live photo that will represent the photo in the Photos app. This can be any frame of the live photo and it's going to be of the same quality as the original key photo. We can also tap and drag on the end handles here to trim the video. Swipe up while we're viewing a live photo to change the animation to loop, bounce, or long exposure. To learn more about these live photo modes and editing live photos, take a look at the What's New in iOS 11 tutorial or the Photos for Mac Edit and Share tutorial. Portrait mode will only be available on an iPhone with dual cameras, so we'll be using the iPhone X in this lesson. I'll swipe over to portrait mode in the camera app. Notice that we zoomed in. This means we have switched to the second, longer focal length camera. But portrait mode actually uses both the cameras simultaneously. A longer focal length, or zoom camera, is being used to focus on the subject. The wider angle camera is being used to be unfocused on the background. So in a portrait mode shot, we have a crisp subject with a heavily blurred background. The iPhone software combines the images created by the two separate cameras to come up with the shot. What's really amazing is that it's seamless and it occurs just about instantly when the shot is taken. We can still tap to focus on an area or adjust exposure. I'm going to tap directly on Dwight's face. We can swipe through five different portrait mode styles that will subtly affect the lighting and background of the subject. The most dramatic of these are the stage light and stage light mono effects, which actually black out much of the background. I'm going to take this shot with the natural light setting. After I tap the shutter, the photo does need a couple seconds to process. 
Before we review this photo, I'm also going to take a standard photo, zoomed in at 2x, which is going to use the second camera only. So here's that standard shot. Notice that the background is pretty crisp. We still see a lot of detail on the wall here. And even far in the background, we can make out dining chairs. Move to the portrait mode shot, and the background is much less detailed. The wall has almost no detail, and the dining chairs in the far background can't be recognized. The subject, though, is still very crisp and well lit. Tap Edit, and we can again switch between all the portrait styles. So these are like effects in that they can be applied before or after the shot is taken. Portrait mode is of course designed for shooting faces, and that's what it does best. But you can also use it to apply a nicely blurred background to an object like the bobblehead dial we're using here, or even leaves or flowers, like in this example. In this shot, the iPhone X does a pretty good job of separating the background from the very irregular shape of the flowers hanging here. When I zoom in, we can see the blur does infringe on the flowers a bit, so the software is not finding the edge perfectly. But overall, it does a nice job of separating the subject, which is in focus, from the background, which is unfocused. Switch to panorama mode in the camera app, and a horizontal graphic pops up, letting us know the direction and the progress of the panorama as it's shot. To switch the direction of the panorama, just tap the panorama graphic. I'm going to stick with left to right. Tap the shutter, and we can begin rotating the iPhone to the right. If I start moving too fast, a warning is going to pop up, telling me to slow down. When I get to a point that I want to end the panorama, I just need to tap the stop button and the panorama is completed. Now over on the iPhone X, I'm going to shoot a full panorama, which means I won't tap the stop button. I'll just keep rotating the phone until the entire panorama graphic is filled and it automatically completes the panorama. Now I'll shoot one from the other direction and stop it manually before it starts shooting the walls of the house. It's also possible to shoot vertical panoramas. Here in standard photo mode, I can't get this entire tree in the shot. But if I switch to panorama, and rotate the phone to landscape orientation, I can then take a vertical panorama from the ground up or the sky down. I'll shoot from the ground up to the top of this tree. That photo turns out okay, but due to the wind, the tree branches turned out a little bit blurry. Shooting still objects like tall buildings can result in really cool vertical panoramas. The iPhone panorama mode is one of my favorite. The camera software does a fantastic job in most cases of stitching together the multiple images that it has to take to complete a panorama. Panoramas are shot at the full resolution of the iPhone camera, which means they'll be very good in photo quality, but can also have large file sizes, up to 63 megabytes for a full width panorama. But for the images that it can produce, a large file size is a small price to pay. Next we'll start looking at the video modes in the iPhone camera. One photo mode that we didn't look at is square. Square mode just shoots an image that's pre-cropped to a square for easy transfer to Instagram, which favors square images. 
When in square mode, you can't use live photo. Next, we'll look at the standard video mode. In the next few lessons, we're going to look at how to shoot in the various video modes available on the iPhone camera. When shooting video, you'll probably use the iPhone in landscape orientation most of the time. Portrait orientation, or vertical videos, don't usually look very good when played back on a TV or any computer display other than a smartphone. So shooting in landscape, like we have the iPhone X right now, is normally the best option. Before shooting a video, we can turn the flash on or off. With the flash in auto mode, the flash icon will pop up on the display to let us know flash is going to be used. But the flash can't be activated after you start recording. Like in photo mode on the iPhone X, we can single tap for a 2x zoom, which is going to use the second camera. Tap and drag for up to a 3x zoom from the wide angle camera and a 6x total zoom with the second camera. While shooting a video, the iPhone can't switch cameras, so it's digital zoom only when shooting video. We're also able to tap to focus and tap and drag to adjust exposure before we shoot the video. So now let's tap the shutter to begin recording. Notice the record time at the top of the display. Tap and drag on the zoom button or use pinch to zoom to zoom in and out while recording. We can also tap to change the focus point or tap and drag to adjust the exposure on the focus point, both during recording. Of course, the iPhone is also going to auto-focus and auto-adjust exposure on the fly. While you're shooting, tap this white shutter button to take a still image that's going to be saved separate from the video. And finally, tap the red shutter again to end the video. It's then saved and can be reviewed along with your photos. When reviewing the video here, we can play it back or quickly scrub through it. Tap the edit button and we can tap and drag on the playhead to scrub through the video. Or tap and drag on either end handle to trim the video. To truly edit the video by adding titles, effects, and other video clips with transitions, you'll want to edit in iMovie or another video editor, which we could jump to by tapping the More button here. A little later in the Camera Settings lesson, we'll go over the options available for video resolution and frame rate for recording. Swipe over to the left from Video Mode, and we move to Slow Motion Video. This will shoot video at either 120 or 240 frames per second. On the iPhone X, both of these frame rates are shot in 1080p, which is 1920 by 1080 pixels. On the iPhone 6s, if we move up to the 240 frames per second setting, the resolution is reduced to 720p, which is 1280 by 720 pixels. So depending on which iPhone model you have, the options for the slow motion video will differ here in camera settings. I'm going to shoot at 120 frames per second on the iPhone 6s and 240 on the iPhone 10. One thing you want when shooting in slow-mo is as much light as possible. Notice that as I move back and forth from video mode to slow-mo, the display on each phone gets a little darker. The camera sensor just can't take in as much light when shooting at these high frame rates. I'm going to turn on an extra light to make sure it's as bright as possible in the room. 
So now let's shoot the bobbling of the Dwight bobblehead in slow motion. I'll try to start recording at the same time on each phone. So now if we start playing those back, notice the iPhone 6s video moves along much quicker because it contains half as many frames. The iPhone 10 is playing back twice as slow because it shot the video at 240 frames per second versus 120 for the iPhone 6s. Now let's tap the edit button. For slow-mo videos, we can again trim the start and end points of the entire video with these handles. But we can also control when the slow motion effect kicks in with these handles. We need to set the start and end points for the slow motion effect before adjusting the end points of the video. So I'm going to have the slow motion effect start right after I start shaking the bobblehead. Notice that the closely spaced lines here refer to regular speed video, and the lines with more space between them represent the slow motion video. Then I'll adjust the endpoints of the video to shorten it up a bit. Notice that if you drag slowly or stay still for a second, these timelines will expand, allowing for very fine adjustments. Tap Done, and I can save the adjusted video as a new clip, and then review it. Time lapse on the iPhone camera is essentially the opposite of slow motion. It records with very low frame rates rather than high ones. Only a few frames per second or less, depending on the length of the video. The iPhone doesn't shoot time lapse in the traditional fashion. Usually, you'd need to set a camera to shoot one frame every certain number of seconds or minutes, depending on the length of the time lapse. Then all those frames are played back in a video at about 30 frames per second, greatly speeding up the action. The iPhone camera continuously takes video, and as the length of the time lapse increases, it only keeps a certain amount of frames from that video. The longer the time lapse, the fewer frames it keeps. So let's shoot a really quick time lapse here. I'll start recording and slowly zigzag the Dwight bobblehead towards the camera. That only took about 15 seconds, so the resulting video will be very short, but we can see the entire path that the bobblehead took so a lot of the frames were kept. Now let's take a look at a time lapse that I took the other day. This was shot over about an hour, but the time lapse video comes in at about 19 seconds. Most time lapses taken on an iPhone will be between 10 and 30 seconds long, depending on how long it took to shoot them. One thing to keep in mind when shooting a time-lapse or even in the other video modes is focus and exposure lock. Notice at the end of this time-lapse the lighting on the tree brightens up. This occurred because the sun went down and the iPhone automatically adjusted the exposure to increase the brightness of the scene a bit. In this case I would have rather had it not done that so the time-lapse would have shown the tree just getting darker. So when you're shooting a time lapse, it can be a good idea to tap and hold on the focus point to lock in exposure and focus 
for the entire length of the time lapse. In the Settings app, we have a camera section, which I'll search for here on the iPhone X and then jump into. Notice we have a couple more options on the iPhone X than on the 6S. Let's start with Preserve Settings. In here, with camera mode switched off, if I take a slow-mo video or panorama, then close the camera app, when I come back, the standard photo mode is automatically selected. With this option on, when I would come back in, the last camera mode used will remain selected. This works the same way with the other two options here for filters and live photos. If there's a certain filter that you like to apply to all your photos, activate this and it's going to be used with each new photo until you change or turn off the filter. With the live photo option on here, if I turn live photo off in the camera app, it won't automatically be activated again the next time I open the app. Turn on the grid option and we simply get a grid overlaid on the viewfinder to help with framing the shot and keeping it level. With the QR codes option on, when the camera sees one of these types of codes, it's going to automatically open a web page. With this off, placing a QR code in front of the camera won't have any effect. Next we have the resolution and frame rate options for standard video. As new iPhones come out, they'll always be able to shoot at higher resolutions and frame rates. The iPhone 10, along with the iPhone 8, can shoot 4K resolution at 60 frames per second, which results in very crisp, smooth videos. The iPhone 6S isn't far behind, with 4K at 30 frames per second. What I really want to look at here though is the data or storage space used by the different formats. Every minute of 4K 60 frame per second video will take up about 400 megabytes. That can add up really fast. So what format you select here can depend on how much storage you have available on your iPhone, how long a video you want to record, and how high in quality you need it to be. The slow-mo setting presents the same choice. A minute of 1080p slow-mo video at 240 frames per second will use almost 480 megabytes of storage space. Here on the iPhone 10, we have a formats option. With high efficiency selected, the camera uses two new video and photo formats, HEIF for photos and HEVC for video. These files aren't going to be able to be played back on all devices, especially those more than a year or two old. So if you're often sending these files to an older PC or mobile device, you might want to downgrade to most compatible. But you can always export your high efficiency photos and videos to different file formats if needed. So for most people, I'd recommend sticking with the high efficiency option here. Finally, we have the HDR settings, which we touched on earlier. Keep Auto HDR on here, and the iPhone X camera decides when it's going to be a good idea to utilize HDR. And turn on Keep Normal Photo to save two images when taking an HDR shot, a standard image and the HDR image. Congrats, you've completed the tutorial. You should now be comfortable using the iPhone camera to shoot in all the available photo and video formats. For most of us, the iPhone is the only camera we always carry around, and for many it's going to be the best camera they've ever owned. The iPhone camera makes it possible to take fantastic shots, no matter what your experience level with photography has been so far. Simply put, it can be a great way to document life. For more on what to do with your photos and videos after you've taken them, check out the tutorials on the Photos app for iOS and Mac. For you iPhone X users or those considering it, take a look at the iPhone X tutorial. Thanks for watching and have fun using your iPhone camera.